Man, we go back into worship. I don't. That's where, it, where it's at. I mean, something awesome about worship that um, everything else we do is honestly it's reciprocal for us from God, but worship is something we do for Him. And he receives that in a way that you can't even understand because we, we're, we're so limited to what we hear, see, feel, taste, smell, our five senses and, and our own unbelief and our own problems. We don't really understand how heaven is receiving our worship. But believe me, trust me, when we worship God and we just get crazy, work, reckless abandonment is the only way I can describe it. God honors that. He really does. I mean, I, I'm. Everybody has a different personality in life, and and uh, what a wonderful life it is to have people with many different personalities. Mine is a little bit extroverted, and so I probably annoy people who are introverted, just like probably people who are introverted kind of annoy me. But I'm I'm learning that God created us all. And he, he loves every one of us, extroverted, introverted. He, and we all have different ways of displaying our love and honor to God. So just because you're not down here being a ruckus doesn't mean you're not honoring, worshiping God. Totally. But I will say there are times that you have to break out of your personality and say, God, I'm putting it all on the line right now. I'm stepping out right now because I've got I've to have something's got to change. And God's like, yeah, it's you, because I'm not stuck. I'm not in trouble. I'm not depressed. My stock market's not in trouble. There's no pandemic in heaven. There's no politics in heaven, thank God. The last dude that tried that got thrown out. <laughs> I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven, right? And that's why we're here in this mess now, because man decided that he didn't think God's plan for him was good. And I think that is a big problem with all of us. We don't necessarily think God's plan for us is good. Because we go through pain, we go through disappointment, we go through trauma, we go through rejection, we go through stuff, and all of a sudden we look around and we go, well, obviously if God is sovereign and he loves me, he wouldn't let me go through this. That is not true. He put his son through great trauma and pain so you could be free. Amen. Amen. And Jesus did it with such amazing love. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. So, hope you all are good this morning. I like it when Rusty gets fired up. I like it when Jeff gets fired up. And now I really like it when my wife gets fired up. <laughs> Woohoo! I'm like... Because that's not her normal mode of operation. So I'm like, let her go. Bless God, I'm not preaching today. I'll sit here. Go, woman, go. Woo, woo, go, woman. <laughs> For those of you who missed a Christmas party, we had a wreath contest. And um, after the wreath contest, I told, um, I told everybody, hey, I'm taking that home. And if you were here, you understand why. All right. You will leave here. Say this out loud with me. Say, I will leave here. here. Encouraged. Encouraged. Built up. up. Strengthened. Strengthened. Amen. Amen. I need you to participate with me. Not because it's for my ego, for my purposes, but it's amazing that if you will actually participate with me, then you will will retain about 90% more than sitting in a relaxed posture, dozing off almost in a comatose state. He said, what happened? There's just a lot of peace at church today. <laughs> what did pastor say? I don't know, but man, I was really at peace. <laughs> so we're going to try something a little bit different. Like I said, I don't, I don't need you. It's not about my ego needing to get fed. Um, my wife does that for me. How does she do that? We won't talk about all that. 
No, I, I just want you to participate. And so it's not about me. It's not about you. It's about the Lord Jesus Christ and it's his word. And we need to honor his word because it says his word is an anchor for what? Our soul. Amen. What is your soul? Your mind, your will, and your emotions. So if the word of God is an anchor for my soul, then I need to involve my mind, my will, and my emotions when I'm receiving the engrafted word of God that is able to save my soul. The word save means sozo. So it's a transformation that's taking place in my soul through the word of God. But if I'm disconnected, and I'm distracted, and I'm sleepy, then I'm not really getting my soul transformed while I'm sitting under the Word. So we're going to try something a little bit different. Y'all with me? Do you want to get the most out of this next four hours? (laughs) I just want to see if you're listening. Do you want to get the most out of this next however long it's going to be? Stand on your feet with me then for a moment. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Now, just say this. I want you to change your posture and your state right now. I want you to say this. The Word of God. The Word of God. Let's say it again. Let's say it again. The Word of God. The Word of God. No, I didn't hear you, buddy. Oh. <laughs> say it one more time. The Word of God. The Word of God. Will transform me. Will transform me. Today. Today. I receive. I the engrafted, the engrafted word, of God. word of God, my mind, my, mind. my, will. my will, and my emotions, and my emotions. Are, being are being transformed. I will not be the same, be the today. same. today. Amen. Now all of a sudden, you, you, you feel the energy? Yes. Do you feel your energy level pick up? Yes. Did you know emotions are about being in motion? You transform your emotions by moving, not sitting around thinking about how bad your life is. Get up and do something. I told my son after he recovered from COVID, I said, listen, the first thing you need to do is go home and clean your nasty room. He don't even live with me. He lives somewhere else. But I know after 14, 15 days of being isolated and playing Xbox and doing whatever he did to be isolated, I know, I know what it probably looked like. And he had this look on his face, and he said, Dad, that's the first thing I did. I got up, took a shower, and I cleaned my entire room. I cleaned everything, washed all my clothes, and I organized my stuff. Listen to me. The first thing you can do if you want transformation is don't check out on Sunday afternoon. Go home and do something productive for 30 minutes. All right, now. During this message, I might have you stand up again, not because we're going to be doing uh, calisthenics, but I just want you to be in tune. Yeah. The Word of God. We, we can't miss these moments. Amen. What are you saying, Pastor? I'm saying I spent 15 hours this week preparing for this moment, and I want to give you everything that's inside of me, and you leave out of here, not because it's about me, but because I prepared myself, and I don't need you sleeping and checking out and looking at your phone and thinking about other things. What you're going to eat today and where you're going to go and who's playing football and if you got Christmas presents and if you got to pee or if you got to do, I want you to be focused. Amen. Why? Because it's important. Something good's happening inside of me. It can happen for you. It should. Amen. Be seated. Be seated now. Yay. All right. So we, we, we all in tune now, right? Open up. You got these scriptures ready, Brian? Genesis 1. Don't put anything else up there but what I gave you. Genesis 1. Say this with me out loud. In the beginning, what? In the beginning, what? God. Who? The self-existent one. Hmm. Nobody created him. Nobody started him. Nobody made him. In the beginning, God. Before anything began, He was already there. We don't understand it because we're finite and we live in this, this linear timeline. But God does not live in your linear timeline. He lives in eternity. And He happens to be your Father. He's not mad at you, upset at you. He's not really wanting to get you. He actually has a plan and a purpose for you. He created you for a purpose. My phone was not designed to be a hammer. My phone was designed to work as a phone, to work as a computer, and to do all the things that it does. Woohoo! It does. Thank God I'm trading it in. 
What I'm saying is, is if, if people know how to put things together that were created with a design and a purpose, then how much more your Father has created you with a design and purpose? In the beginning, God, what did He do? What did He do? What did He create? The heavens and the earth. Well, He just stopped there and said, I don't want anything else. No, no. He wanted more. He wanted more. He created humans so He could watch them suffer and have pain. What a sadistic Father we have. But that's the way we treat him. That's the way we think about it. We won't say it because we can't admit that we feel like God is out to get us. It is a lie from the pits of hell. It's a lie from the fallen man. It's a lie from your mind that's not been renewed. It's a lie from your circumstances that have happened to you. It's a lie all the way around. God created everything for you to enjoy. But don't Christians suffer? Absolutely. Absolutely. I didn't say you wouldn't suffer. He didn't say you wouldn't suffer. But he created you with a purpose. Now, man was not originally created to suffer. Man was originally created to enjoy. But it didn't happen. So, next verse I got, verse 2. Look at this. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was doing what? Hovering. Hovering over the face of the waters. Stop right there. So, listen. Your life that has darkness right now, your life that has no meaning in certain areas, I'm not talking about all the areas of your life, maybe places in your life where it seems to be trouble, maybe it's family situations, maybe it's financial situations, maybe it's your health, whatever it is. If you allow the Spirit of God to hover, it's like a hen does over her eggs. It's a brooding. The Spirit of God will brood over you, and what He wants to do is to create. Now, there's something really weird that I learned. And when I say this, I'm probably going to get some backlash because it sounds kind of weird. But does anybody here know Hebrew? I don't either. (laughs) But I did learn, did you know that magic word we say, abraca? Did you know that's Hebrew? I didn't either. Did you know that's how you say it in Hebrew, is abracadabra? I didn't know that because we go poof, abracadabra. Did you know what it means in Hebrew? I speak, and therefore I create. (laughs) Well, does that not line up with what I've been saying for the last four weeks? What have you been speaking? Because, hold on a minute. God said the earth was out for him, and it was darkness, and the Holy Spirit was hovering. The Spirit of God was hovering over it. And what was the next thing that God did? What was the next thing that he did? He said, abracadabra. He spoke and created. Look at verse 26 now. Thank you. Verse 26. Genesis 1, 26. So the Spirit of God, when He is like when we're in this place and my wife is doing, I'm like, whoa, the Spirit of God is here. The Spirit of God, whoa, it's time to speak. It's time to speak. When do you speak? When He's hovering over you. That's when the creative power comes into your life. Then God said. Let us make man, what, in our image and according to our likeness, and let them have, what, dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over all the cattle and over the earth and all the creeping things that creep on the earth. So God it said, let us give man, Elohim, let us give. Elohim said to man, I'm giving you authority. I'm giving you dominion. I'm giving you creative power. So there was this really powerful evangelist, and he was really profound guy and he traveled a lot and one day he was traveling up north and he saw this beautiful farm I mean it had rows and rows of vegetables and it had trees that were planted fruit trees planted and I mean this thing was just gorgeous in the way it was manicured and and it had fence posts that were nice and he just got full of himself and he pulled into the farmer and he stopped and he got on he said hey God sure did bless you with a great farm didn't he look at what he gave you and that farmer in his wisdom said, yes, yes, God gave me the seed. God gave me the sun. God gave me the water to take care of this farm. But you should have seen what this looked like before God let me have it. Ouch. What are you saying, Pastor? I'm saying that God wants to co-create with you. He, he's given you all the natural raw resources to prosper in your life. He's given you everything you need. But if you reject those things, then don't blame God because things aren't going the way you thought they should. 
I mean, what I'm saying is the farmer bought the piece of land, and he could have just sat there and thought, well, God, will you please come out here and put these seeds in the ground? God! Now God's going to make the sun come, He's going to make the rain come, and He's going to make the seeds do what they do. But He's expecting you to get up and do something. This is what I'm trying to get across to all of us. We need to take steps for God to bless us. And you need to get out of your mind being blessed is looking like somebody else is blessed. Because sometimes those people's lives are nearly as blessed as what they put on Facebook. You need to say, what does it look like for me to be blessed and successful? And it might just be in having peace in your home and joy and having your family around you and eating a meal together and saying, Whoa, now this is what I call blessings. Right? So I'm just saying, sometimes we define what success is in our own mind, and if we don't have that picture met, we feel like we're failures, and that could be farther from the truth. Hmm. Thank you, Lord. Hmm. So, say this now. We're going to do it. Stand up with me. Ha ha. I don't want to lose you. Stand up with me. It's getting a little warm in here. Say this with me. Say, I'm a child of God. I've been bought by the blood of Jesus. Purchased. Purchased. Woo, redeemed. I'm not a stepchild. I'm not an orphan. I'm a son. I'm a daughter. Yeah, but say whatever gender you are, I don't care. I'm a child of the living God. Hallelujah. My daddy loves me. Whew. Amen. You can say that I'm his favorite. I'm his favorite. Amen. Sit down. Thank you. I'm just trying to keep you engaged with me this morning. You're created in the image of God. He's given you authority. He wants to create with you. He wants to co-labor with you. He wants you to prosper in everything that you put your hand to. He wants you to prosper in your relationships. He wants you to prosper at your job. More than anything, He wants you to prosper in your mind. If your mind says there's no way out, it quits looking for a solution. I get presented to me all the time, oh, we got big problems. I'm like, great, we got big answers. My mom called me up, she says, oh, we got a mess, son. We, 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 we. I was like, who's we, sucker? I don't know about we. You got a mess. Why am I all of a sudden in the picture with we? How did I get the, what, did, what happened here? Yeah, but she mama, she said, we, we, got, we got a mess, son. I said, what's up? Y'all want to know, don't you? So the van was not in her name. It was in my dad's name. He had the van finance with State Farm. Did you know State Farm used to do financing? They just got bought out by U.S. Bank. But they wouldn't work with her. She'd been making payments. No behind, nothing late. Good, and They just wouldn't work with her. They said, hey, we're just going to come get the van. Not behind, nothing. I said, she said, we got a mess. I said, no, we got an opportunity. You know what your opportunity is? You're fixing to get a 2020 car. And be blessed. She's like, really? I said, yeah, come on, let's go. And I helped her find a 2020 car. Now, listen. They only had 12 miles on it. But there are scammers. Not scammers in this sense that they, uh, auto traders. So auto trader puts out a price. They, they're a third party for these different vehicle companies. And they lie to you. So I took a screenshot of the thing. God said, I called him twice as an hour and a half drive up all the way up to Mall of Georgia. And I said, will you honor this? Oh, yes, sir, we'll honor that. Take a screenshot. Get there. Oh, they did not want to honor it. But I, 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 you know, I know I'm changed. Because I was so peaceful. The guy goes, I, I said, sir, do you ever have other customers that get upset at you about this stuff? He goes, all the time. I'm so tired of having to deal with this. I said, why are you trying to make a living off of being dishonest then? And he was Arabic. So I said, keep holic. So that's some Arabic. It's like three words I know. <laughs> and he's like, oh, you speak Arabic? I said, three words, bro. She was mat, which is, what is your name? And he's like, Wow. So then I was relating to him on a personal level now. And I said, I will work with you guys, even though you're not wanting to work with me and honor what you said. If you can just look at me in the eyes and tell me what you are doing is dishonest. 
He said, well, it's a third party. I said, I'm not going to work. He said, yes, sir, it's dishonest. I said, great, now I can work with you. I'll even pay a little more because I understand what you put on there. It's just basically get foot traffic. I don't even know why I'm going here right now other than my mom is blessed. What I'm saying is there's no sense in me getting upset, pitching a fit, cussing him out, running around, and I'm threatening him. I, nothing like that. Why? I, and then I went to the finance guy, and his name is Mr. Kim. Anyon Hashimika. You know what I mean? So that's a formal way of saying hello in Korean. And when I said Onion Hoseo to him, which is an informal way of saying hello, he said, oh, you speak Korean, and he just got all giddy. And so I let him talk about all the Korean and the kimchi that, ooh, is really fermented cabbage, and it's really spicy, and it'll knock the back of your head off. I said, hey, <laughs> after we talked, and he talked for 15 minutes, and I know in the culture in the Koreans, even though he's been in America for a while, they hate being com confrontation is a shameful thing to confront them about something. It's called saving face, and you just don't do it in their culture. So I try to present it in a way. I was like, hey, I'm really trying to take care of my mom. Hey, do you, you, my mom went to South Korea with me. She goes, oh, and they made me ride in the front seat, and they just honored me and loved me. He goes, yes, man, we do that in our culture. I said, so, so your culture wouldn't allow someone to take advantage of uh, uh, someone's mom, would they? Oh, no. I said, well, why is your company doing that? Oh, man, it got, all of a sudden, the oxygen just went out of the room. Yeah, you know what happened? We got a better interest rate because of that. <laughs> so there's a way just to come about things, guys, in your life and in your own soul without coming and punching somebody. Learn how to communicate. Learn how to relate to a person on a human level, who they are, and finding something in common with them, and then turning it back around on them in not an offensive way, but a way that makes them go, ooh, yeah. And he always said, I'm going to talk to the manager because auto traders should put a disclaimer on there. It says, this is the mount, but there's other fees. And they didn't. They had no disclaimer, which is totally illegal, but that's okay. It doesn't matter. I still got the car 20% less than what it was, brand new. And I was like, it drives like a dream. So we can have joy in even intense situations. Because nobody wants to drive an hour and a half with your mom and then, and then find out they're, they're being lied to. All right? Ooh, I'm fighting words right there. Praise well, God. I'm from the South. We don't put up that crap. <laughs> I know because we're a bunch of egotistical pigs and feel like we got to prove something to someone every time. We won't take care of mamas. Even though probably don't because she needs a grass cut, we won't go and do that. I'm just kidding, but that's most people's, you know, she's like, what? Well, you don't know most people that I know. They have this, I want to take care of mama, but they really don't want to take care of mama. It's just a fighting thing for them. But that's, that's like, you know, never mind. Back in the 80s, if you said your mama, you were fighting with the kids on the playground. But that same mama you're trying to protect, when she told you to pick up your clothes, you didn't do it. So it ain't about your mama, it's just about fighting an ego. Okay. Sorry. I'm moving on. John 14. Say this with me. I'm a son and daughter of God. Feels pretty good, doesn't it? Your, your daddy's richer than Bill Gates. Thank God. Warren Buffett don't know how much your father has. His streets are made of gold. His gates are made of pearls. His throne and the rainbow around it is full of jasper and diamonds and every other precious stone you can imagine. Hallelujah. If you love me, keep my commandments. Thank you, Lord. Next verse. And I will pray the Father and he will give you another helper that he may abide with you just temporarily because you're a little brat and we have to leave you sometimes. What does it say? Forever. Dash. That dashes it forever. I'm going to pray the Father. And that prayer has been answered. Who is the person Jesus said is the helper? The paraclete, the one to come alongside. The Holy Spirit. He's not Jesus' third cousin. He's God. Next verse. The Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees Him nor knows Him. But you know Him, for He dwells with you and will be. Where? Lift up you and say, he's in me. He's in me. Ooh, you're saying you've got God himself in you right now. 
You're not outside the family. You got God whoa, almighty inside of you. Hallelujah. There's no failure with that. Mm. Thank you, Lord. Verse 18. Look what he says here. I will come and I will not leave you. Is what? I will come to you. This was the children of Israel's problem. God says, I'm delivering you out of Egypt. You've been in a hard taskmaster. 400 years you've been serving this dude. He's been making you slaves. And I'm going to deliver you with my mighty right hand. And I'm going to lead you out into the wilderness. And I'm going to bless you. And I'm going to take you into the promised land. And everybody's like, yes! And Moses shows up. He th- and man, he delivers the children of Israel. And I'm telling you, he gets called by God to go up into a mountain to seek the Lord. And he's no longer up there. That They start going crazy. What were they doing? They were being big orphans because they didn't trust the leadership of their father. They didn't trust that he was good. They didn't think he was good. What did they say to Aaron? Well, Moses, he must be dead up there. He's delaying and we're bored. You know, look at me. Look at me. Do you know that's 90% of our problems is we're bored? How do you know that? Because we're trolling. People with purpose ain't trolling. People with destiny ain't got time for that nonsense. People with destiny and purpose don't worry about what their friends are doing or what their mama's doing or their cousins are doing. All they know is I'm focused. I'm going after something. God has got me here for a reason, and I'll be blessed. God, I'm going to have it done now. Purpose. We get bored. We start looking for idols. Could be a 65-inch screen TV screen that I just bought. (laughs) It's not my idol, though. I had to have a new one because I broke my last one. The orphan heart came out. The Bulldogs lost to Florida and I lost my mind. Sorry. God delivered me for the rest of the year. I don't have to worry about it now. No tensions there. I can be at peace. Until next year. And then we'll have to put a rubber screen in front of the TV. Don't be an orphan. What does it mean to be an orphan? It means that your father loves you, but sometimes when things are delayed or things are not happening your way, you immediately revert back to your old ways. You revert back to your old personality. You revert back to, well, I, I'm just, this always happens to me. Nothing ever good happens to me. We, never, I, we can never get ahead. You're now saying those things in an emotional state, and you're actually now putting that thing in place in your life as faith. Nothing good ever happens for me. Nobody loves me. As soon as things delayed, as soon as you get a little rejection, as soon as little things go wrong in your life, you immediately revert back to being an orphan. But I thought you had a father who loves you. Mm. I'll not leave you as an orphan in Egypt. I'm going to bring you out, and I'm going to give you the wealth of the Egyptians. Glory to God. Everybody gets excited about that. But then all of a sudden, I'm going to have Moses go up in a mountain and you're going to sit there with all that wealth and not know what to do with it and get bored and talk Aaron into making an idol. What are we doing? We, we can look at that and go, well, them dummies. No, 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 no. God brought you out of darkness, healed your body, delivered you, blessed you. And just because it's not happening right now, you forgot what he did. Look what the Lord has done. <laughs> Say this with me loud. I'm adopted. I'm adopted. But I'm working on that orphan heart. Mm. Thank you, Lord. Go to Romans 8, 15. Say, I'm adopted. I'm adopted. I'm, adopted. I'm blessed. Could you imagine if you got adopted by some? Oh, man. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear. Oh, my goodness. But you received the spirit of what? Whereby we cry what? Abba. Papa. Woo! Daddy God. Woo, 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 woo. Why are you saying it like this? Because you know what it's doing? Every time I get excited and say it, my mind starts believing it. Every time I say it in an emotional state, my mind goes, that fool actually believes he's adopted by God. 
He really thinks God is his daddy. He thinks he's a son of God. Woo! Woo! Can you do it with me? Stand up with me. Let's just try it. I dare you to do it like you actually believe you're a son of God. Come on! Woo! Yeah! Say it, I'm a son of God. Come on now. If Bill Gates and all of his, whatever his political views are that I don't agree with, if he just stepped down out of his uh, opulence and come down to your little lowly house tomorrow and said, Son, don't worry about nothing no more. I'm your daddy. I got you covered. I got your kids covered, your grandkids. Oh, man, I mean 10 generations I've got them covered. Would you just stand there and go, Well, okay. I'd be like, (laughs) It's not about the material things. It's about knowing your Father loves you and He wants you to have peace and He wants you to have joy and He wants you to have love and He's got it all for you. And you just have to receive it and have to put yourself in a place where you actually believe He is who He says He is. So tell your mind right now, He's my Father. He's not upset at me. Do your kids disappoint you, Pastor? Dear God, does anybody have kids in this room? <laughs> but it doesn't make them not my kids. Amen. You can you seated. I, I just, he's my father. He didn't give you a spirit of fear. He didn't give you a spirit of bondage. Look at that. Look at that word, bondage. Fear has bondage. You know the reason we keep doing some of the things that we're doing is because we're afraid. The reason we keep repeating the same patterns is because we're afraid. We're afraid what's going to happen and what other people are going to say about us, what they're going to think about us. What is it going to do to my friends or my family? What is so-and-so going to say if I start doing this? Who cares? Because so-and-so ain't going to pay your bills. So-and-so ain't going to cook your food. They might love on you if somebody dies in your family and bring you a meal one time. But bless God, they're not lining up to serve you like a chef every night. So quit worrying about what people think about you, say about you. do. Uh, well, well, you're basing your decisions on fear, and that's what it is. Mm. I see the cogs and the, the little wheels turning right now. All kinds of things are going, oh, man, I ain't making that decision no more. You're right. Jade, you shouldn't be a real estate agent. You know, you know it's really hard. It's really hard to be a real estate agent. I mean, you know, what did you do? You went and got your real estate license and you sell houses. But you're also a nurse. You're also a musician. You're also a worshiper. But most of all, you're a daughter. Amen. And that's what's the most important thing. Amen. You're loved. You're a daughter. Yes. What you do is wonderful. Ephesians 1 5. Just want you to see these verses. Having predestined us to the what? To be orphans for the rest of our lives. <laughs> to the adoptions as sons by Jesus Christ Himself according to the good pleasure. This was His good pleasure to make you a son and daughter. This was not just some afterthought. This was not something that He just thought, well, no, He said, This is my pleasure. Hallelujah. This is good pleasure. There's nothing that brings me greater pleasure. Not I, Yes, I love when my children do things and, and, and they, they are successful things. I love it. I, I think it's wonderful. But it's also wonderful when they just come to me and say, Hey, Daddy, I just love you because you're my daddy. Amen. But then they try stuff that they've never tried before. Like Luke building a deck at a house. Whew. I was like, all right, all right, you try it. You, got, you know, the, 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 um, the rails are, I feel like I'm in the, uh, fixing to go into a, <laughs> a freaking cage match on a wrestling team. The, the, the rails are about this high <laughs> on a deck that, you know, I was like, why'd you put them up that high? Well, I just, I, so we, we adjusted things, and, you know, things weren't just straight and stuff. And, but guess what? He, he did it. He did it. 
And I'm not going to make him feel bad. I'm going to like help him fix what he messed up. I'm not much better, honestly, but I'm a little better than that. But it didn't matter to the people who paid $249,000 for the house, did it? They didn't go out there and go, well, bless God, this little board's half an inch longer than that other board. You've got to come out here and trim this board. They didn't even see it. Why? Because when you're going to buy a house, you're not looking at all the details necessarily. Now, there are some anal people. Excuse me. Okay, look at the next verse. Hebrews 1. Say Hebrews 1. Verse 1. God who has various times and in various ways spoken times past by the prophets, to our fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by who? Whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom he also made the worlds. Who being the brightness of his glory and express image of his person, upholding all things by the word of his power. Who he himself, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand. Where? On the majesty on high. Next verse. Did I just put the verse in the, uh, keep going? Having become, we'll go back. Verse 4. Having become so much better than the angels, as by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. Next verse. For to which of the angels he ever said, You are my son, today I have begotten you. Which to any of the angels did he ever say, You are my son and daughter? None. But to Jesus, what did he say? And again, verse 6. I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me what? Okay, stand on your feet. I can feel the law. Say, I'm a son. I'm a daughter. I'm a child of God. He didn't leave me outside as an orphan. If he can take my little pastor su- surprise who lived in a thatch roof hut, who grew up pulling roots and things for his family, growing up as a child, his fingers are all twisted and broken from having to work hard as a child. If he can take him and raise him up as an international pastor and give him a brand new house and give his wife a Lexus and give him a, uh, a land cruiser, and, I mean, give it, people giving it to him and bless him. He lived in a thatch roof hut. Why? Only because he knew he was a son. And none of those things have pastor surprise. If you ever met him, he's a man full of joy and peace and love. He'll give those things to you. He doesn't need those things. He takes care of thousands of orphans a day. It just flows through him. He's just full of joy. Why? Because he's realized, I'm the most loved, favorite son. Your limitations are not imposed on you by God, but by your own belief system. You only believe God can bless you this much. But He wants to bless you so much you can take care of orphans and widows and those that can't help themselves. He wants to bless you coming in. He wants to bless you going out. He wants to bless your hands. He wants to bless your life. He wants to bless you with more than enough. So you won't sit there and try to hold on. What if the rainy day comes? Good. That means it waters your crops and you get a harvest. Don't worry about it. Goodness gracious. Say this with me. I'm a son. son. Better than an angel. angel. I'm a daughter. Verse 6. You can be seated. Hallelujah. Y'all getting it with me? Are we we engaged? We only got a few more minutes. I only got 27 more verses. When when, When he begins to bring the firstborn to the world, he says, what does he say? This is the time of year. What does he say? Let all the angels of God worship him. So when we turn our affections towards heaven and we worship God, when we don't see it, when we're going through struggles, when life is painful and we worship God anyway, he goes, oh, look at them people. They're in faith. They're worshiping me. They got hell stacked against him. I, I, I can't remember the guy's name. I got I to gotta go back and find out. I'm going to get his book. There was, he was an um, Air Force fighter pilot, him and two other guys, and he got shot down over Vietnam. And they all survived and they all got captured. Now one of them, they were captured and they were put into a cell that was no wider than my body and six foot long. That's where they had to live. They were tortured and they were beat mercilessly every day. They were given just the bare minimum to survive on as far as food. One of them killed himself, couldn't handle it. The other one is in a psych ward. I think he might be gone now, but when he got out of this, they were there for seven years. The one guy, I'm like, i got to read his book. Because this one guy, he figured out a way to prosper in that hole. 
He came out stronger, better. He says, I would not trade those seven years for anybody. Some of us, including myself, get uncomfortable waiting in line at Walmart or Kroger. We get upset when the light doesn't change quick enough. I've never been put in that kind of pressure cooker. I've never been put in the circumstances where everything has been taken from me and I'm being beaten and fed just little food. He worked out. He says, you know what? I was so close to God when I got out of there because he's the only person I could talk to. My God. Woo! What happened is he realized he was a son. He realized God didn't do this to him. See, that's, that's the first thing you got to do with is stop thinking your problems are coming from your father. Amen. He's not a child abuser. Religion will tell you that. Well, God going to get you. You better watch out. He's not Santa Claus. He doesn't hold from you. Every good and perfect gift comes from our father. There's no variableness. He doesn't change. He's not schizophrenic. Get her. You got the yawn going on. We have to get up again. Y'all tell Sage, wake up! (laughs) All right, verse 6. Now, thank you. Go to verse 7 and verse 8. We're going to finish up. I got to get to work. I got to get to my last three things. And the angels of the Lord says, who makes his angels spirits ministries, flames of fire? He's given angels to you to assist you. He's given angels to assist you. Say this, I am a son and a daughter and I have angels. And they assist me. They respond to your words. They respond to your words. They respond to your words. If I'm, feel, I'm feeling sick, I'm broke, I don't like this person. They just make me so mad I could just kill them. I don't know what I'm going to do with that person. And just get on my flipping nerves. The angels are going, yep, I guess you're inviting the demons because those are fallen angels and they're listening. The other angels are going, please say something awesome. Please say something good. Give me something to do. I am bored. I've been crocheting your whole life because you won't say anything positive. And I'm not just a positive confession guy. You can't go to your garden and say, there will be no weeds here. There will be no weeds here. Weeds are going to grow up in your garden, big dummy. No, what do you got to do? You got to go out and pull the weeds. But you can ask God to give you strength. And you can ask God to protect you. And you can ask God for his angels to come and surround you. And you can ask God to bring you provision as you put your hands to something and prosper. Verse 8. To the son, he says, your throne, O God, is forever a scepter of righteousness, your scepter of your kingdom. We're sons and daughters. We've been seated with Christ in heavenly places. Hallelujah. 2 Corinthians 5, 7, 5, 6, and 7. 2 Corinthians 5, 6, and 7. Now we're, we're, we're shifting gears over into faith. So we're always confident knowing that while we're at home in the body, we're absent from the Lord, meaning that we're not eternally with Him. Next verse. For we walk by what? So everything I'm teaching you and saying to you is by faith. It's not by sight. Well, I don't feel like I'm a son and daughter. I, that's not any of y'all. That's my little voice of unbelief that comes up at times. I don't feel like a son and daughter. You're probably not going to feel like it 90% of the time. But if you start telling yourself you are in a, an emotional state that you are, you'll walk out of you with your head held up and go, wow, I'm a child of the king. I'm blessed coming in. I'm blessed going out. Yeah. Well, you sure are cocky. Well, whatever, however you perceive it as your result, that's your issue, not mine. Amen. Second Corinthians 4.18. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are what? Everything going on in your life that's not the way it should be, it's temporary. Say this with me. It's subject to change. What happens to us is, uh, what happens to me or all of us, we go through something and when that situation starts happening, it, it causes a, um, in your neurons, in your brain, it causes this image to, to solidify. To, I don't know the right medical terminology, but it's like it's, it's solid in your brain, that image is. And then the next time you're going through life and something else comes up, what comes up is that image. And what do you do? You start reliving that image. But that image is not even real. It's something that might have had 10 years ago. You're like, oh, I, 
this feels like the abuse that I went through. I, I, I'm fixing to get abused again. You're not. It's just you're reliving an emotion. And, and now you've got to retrain your brain to think different thoughts. That's why he says in Romans 12 too, renew your mind. So how do you get your mind renewed? You've got to tell that thought, no! I'm a son, I'm a daughter. And you need to do it in an emotional state so your mind will go, huh, he actually believes he's blessed. I think I'm going to agree with the guy. Say this with me. Subject to change. Temporary. Doesn't have to stay. We can't look at it with our natural eyes. Well, how do I look at it with my spiritual eyes? I'll tell you, real simple. It's one way. Pray in tongues, in the spirit, read the word. Let me tell you how you look at it in the spirit. Where does your father live? He does not live in linear time. Where does he live? It's through faith and imagination. It's th- Do you want your life to change? You have to use your faith and you have to use your sanctified imagination and you have to image, create an image in your mind that your father's in eternity and you get to sit in his lap and go, Whoa! You are a good father. How often do you do that? You do that until you replace the negative image so the next time you're triggered, it doesn't come up. All you see is yourself sitting with your father and not being abused or rejected or neglected or going through loss and trauma. All you see is the goodness of God. This will, this will transform your life. I have to do this all the time. I go through triggers all the time. I'm a human. I have triggers, but I've learned to overcome these triggers and still allowing the enemy to come in from back here. You know how sometimes your thoughts want to come in and overtake you? It feels like they're just like wanting to overshadow you and go, Ugh, and vomit on you, and it's emotionally charged, and you find yourself almost in like this, this anxiety. And what is it called when you go into a, a, an anxiety attack? Panic attack. Thank you. You feel yourself, your heart racing, and all of a sudden, you know what? You can use that for your benefit. Instead of saying, oh, I'm having a panic attack, you're saying, I'm fixing to have a Holy Ghost fit right now in Jesus' name. Well, how do you know that? Because I've, seen, I've listened to people who are musicians that fix to go on the stage and perform. And this one young lady, she, she had thousands, tens of, she big conference. She already started going through panic attacks. And she couldn't even, she froze and couldn't even go out on the stage. And you know what she would say? I'm, 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 I'm having a panic attack. And she would freeze up and wouldn't go out there. This other guy who was, uh, I'm not even going to share their names, great musician. He was going through the same thing, but instead of him allowing it, instead of him saying it's a panic attack, you know what he's saying? Whoa, this is what I need. Um, I feel energy. And he changed his emotional state by not allowing what was happening to him to stop him, but used it to energize him. Now, it's not easy to do that, but I'm telling you, once you learn how to do that, you're not going to, if you go through, I rebuke the devil. I'm not belittling anxiety attacks and, and, and panic attacks. I'm not at all. They're terrible. I've had a couple of them. That was years ago. But I'm not going to put up with them. Mm. I'm not going to put up with them. They're liars. There's times I'm up here worshiping and the devil says, Why are you worshiping God? Why are you worshiping God? You lost your son. Your son's dead. Why are you worshiping God? You can't. Be, what am I going to do? Well, I ain't going to fake it. I'm going to be authentic. You know what I'm telling? Whoa! I sent my son on the greatest vacation you could ever imagine. And even though I don't get to talk to him, even though I don't get to see him and hear from him, he's in the most secure place you could imagine. He is actually having the time of his life. And the last thing he wants me to do is sit on this front row and start feeling sorry for my stupid little self. I tell myself that so you can go to hell, panic attack. You can go to hell, trauma. I'm going to lift my hands and I'm going to worship God Almighty right now because he's a good father. What are you going to do with it? That's what I do. 
you know what happens? The thing that he tried to do to choke me out of worship actually now accelerates me into worship. I'm like, why? Because then I start using my imagination, and I'm like, what are they even doing up there? And I see Josh going, Ooh, come on, Dad, come on, Dad, come on, Dad. You remember the dream I had? You remember the dream I had where Josh was on the top of the mountain, and I was down here? He said, come up here, Dad. And I said, okay. And I went up to the top of the mountain. He goes, you've got to pull the people up here. They're, they're only seeing from this perspective. They're not seeing from this perspective. So everything you're going, that's going on in your life right now is all about your own perspective. It's about how you're seeing and perceiving the situation. And you can turn that situation around with faith and knowing that God is with you, that God loves you, that He is for you, not against you. Who can separate me from the love of God? Can death, can life, can pestilence, can anything, nothing can separate me from God's love. Not even my own flaky mind. Not even my own situations. I have to change my mind. I have to think different about God. I have to lift myself up and go, Oh, God, you are good. You're good all the time. You're not just good on Sunday. You're not good when the bills are paid. You're not good when I flip a house. You're good when things are going bad. Hallelujah. Y'all need to stand back up. Man, I'm fixing to get... Y'all need to look it up. It's, uh, it's called uh, uh, evangel- Linebacker Evangelist. And people wouldn't witness, and he, all of a sudden he'd blow people up. He'd tackle them out of nowhere. You going to witness? No, and all of a sudden Linebacker Evangelist coming. Tackle them. You're going to witness that person right now. I'm going to start having people running from the side of the room and blowing you up. Boom! Say it with me. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a child of God. My Father's good. I've been redeemed by the blood. I've been redeemed by the blood. Not some cheap gold and silver that perishes away, but by the precious blood of God, I've been redeemed. Hallelujah. You've been purchased, bought. You've been received and redeemed by God's love. Woo! (laughs) I feel energy. I feel fire of God. It's running through my veins. I'm a child of God. I'm a child of God. I'm a child of God. Can you maintain this kind of energy? Absolutely. Every day, every second, you can. Hebrews 11.1. 1. Everybody okay? Everybody okay? Now faith. Say this with me. Now faith. faith. When am I going to get in faith? Say right now. Why? Because without faith, it says it's sin. Did y'all know that? Did y'all know that it says without faith, it's sin? Now, faith is the substance of what? Things hoped for and the evidence of things what? Not seen. We have to have faith to access God, and we have to believe God, and it's in your imagination. Your sanctified imagination. Well, isn't that just weird? No, what's weird is you imagine bad things are going to happen to you, but you don't have problems with that. Or you imagine the bad things that did happen to you are going to happen to you again. But you don't have a problem with that. Couldn't you imagine that God is good and He's got good plans for you? That He has a hope for you? That He has a future for you? That He wants to do something good with your life? Or did He just create you to suffer? Just a, no, good Lord. Seven years that guy was in that little hole and he'd get out and get beat. But man, he'd come out. I've got to read his book because I've got to find how did he. He said, God was my friend. He's the only person I got to talk to for seven years. I couldn't imagine seven days. I got delayed on a flight, an a, 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 a international flight, and had to spend the night in the airport in, in Hong Kong, China. And it was miserable sleeping when you're six foot two, sleeping in those seats with a little armrest that, you know, don't lift up. And i am got my legs all like this, and Luke on top of me, and Kendra turned on the other end, and I'm like, <laughs> that was just for 24 hours. I couldn't imagine being put in a hole. What I'm trying to say is if God can show one man how to overcome, we can all do what he did. And you're not, we're not even, so I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to say what we're facing. I'm not trying to say, help me Lord, say this right. I'm I'm not trying to make you feel bad because what you're going through, what you're going through is real. It's real. What I'm trying to say is if somebody can overcome this, if we can just figure out a little bit of what we did, we can overcome everything. Greater is he. Then he. Hmm. Next verse. 
for it by the elders obtained a good testimony. So your faith will obtain a good testimony. Next verse. This is it. By faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. So that things which are not seen were things which so that things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. Huh. Go back to that verse. Let's look at this. By faith. By what? By what? We understand that the world's, oh, ho, oh, oh. no, 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 listen, that's, that's a terrible translation. Change that word in the Hebrew or Greek, actually, to eons or time, history. We understand that history, time, were framed by the Word of God. By faith, you can change your history. By faith, you can change your timeline. Oh, this is... What are you doing, Pastor? I'm getting with my Father who lives in eternity, and I'm sitting in His lap, and I'm looking at what He looks at for my life, and I'm saying what He says about my life and not what I say about my life because I've been saying some bad things about my life. So I get with my Father, and I go, well, He's a good Father. He loves me. His plans for me to prosper me. I'm a pretty good dad, and I say good things about my kids. How, what are you saying about me? He goes, oh, let me show you. I'm so glad you took the time to sit in my lap. I'm so glad that you stood up here in your imagination in eternity with me. Now let me show you what I'm saying about you. And I'm not saying it back here, son. I'm saying it right here. This is how I see you. I don't see you back here. I see you right here. So I see you through my son's blood. So I see you perfect. I see you whole. I see you complete. I see you without sin. I see you blameless. I see you forgiven. I see you prosperous. I see you encouraged. I see you healthy. Oh, Jesus. What? No, 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 no. What, what, what? Who you been sitting with? You been sitting with the gossip train called Facebook? You been sitting with your friends? Who are you sitting with? You sitting with your neighbors, your coworkers, your family that loves you, but they don't want you know people don't want you to make it. Never knew I had haters until I started prospering. But faith winners in the world. So your time, frame, look it up. That word says eons. That word worlds is eons or time. History. We're framed by the word of God. So things which are Seeing we're not made of things which are visible. So the things you're seeing right now can change. They're subject to change. They're subject to change. They're subject to change. Whatever you're going through is subject to change. It's to change what your Father has for you. I've been saying this like five different ways. Y'all need to stand up. Y'all, y'all done? We need to go? I got three things you can do. Let's go into them right quick. Did I miss some verses? No, no, no. We'll just skip down. We're not going to go to other verses. Go to Jeremiah 29, 11. I'm going to end with this. Three things. I want you to write these things. Purpose. Say purpose. purpose. Who was wrote that book, Purpose Driven Life? Rick Warner. Great life because, but you know what? People are trying to find their purpose in doing something. Okay, there was some real good truth in that. And it got the body of Christ kind of got activated and started doing things. So I'm not against the book. But here's the thing. you got to know what your father's purpose is for you. Amen. But what if your father said, hey, hey, I'll enjoy whatever you do because I love you. Amen. Well, isn't that a day? I mean, do I, do I sit there with my kids and say, you're going to do my purpose. <laughs> this is my purpose for you. Well, I know parents that are manipulative and controlling like that. No, I want my kids to go, hey, Dad, I think I want to be a slacker and live off you for the rest of my life. No, that's not your purpose. <laughs> no. If, if, if Lauren, she wants to be a vet tech, okay, great. Because I'm like, why don't you just go to be a nurse? I don't like people. <laughs> <laughs> she says animals are my friends. Okay. But you know, if that's what she wants to do, I want her just to be a daughter. And whatever she does is wonderful. So we just need to take it easy and go, I've got to find God's purpose. God's purpose. And it's saying, be a son first, be a daughter first. 
And from that, you can relax, and then you can start moving in the things that He has for you. Look at your 29. For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. Hallelujah. Say this with me out loud. I put, my hands in, I put myself in God's lap right now. I put myself in Father's lap. Come on, say it. I put myself in Father's lap right now. I put myself in my Father's lap right now. Because His thoughts towards me are hope, a future, expected end. Woo! His thoughts towards me are good. So if I sit in his lap long enough, I'm going to hear his thoughts. And I'm going to get up and go, I think I'm going to do this. Now he put it on my heart to start children's homes all over the world. He put it on my heart to feed orphans and take care of widows. He put it on my heart to, to preach the gospel and see souls saved. He put it on my heart to be a healing miracle revivalist that transforms cities and nations through the power of God's love. He put it on my heart because I sat with him. And all these things, I'm like, ooh. And you know what? I found out actually he was tricky because that was all in my heart all along. Delight yourself in the Lord God and he'll give you the desires of his heart. No, it says of your heart. So as I said in his lap, little sneaky, sneaky Jehovah, Father said, oh, I'm going to show you what my thoughts are. And I'm like, man, I love these thoughts. He goes, son, I put them in you when I created you. Because this is, <laughs> no wonder I get joy out of loving orphans. No wonder I get joy out of taking care of the poor. No wonder I get joy out of helping people. Why? Because I sat there with my father and it became, oh, really? That was sneaky? But you know what? It's no different if I sat in his lap and I had a heart to be an engineer. And I said, oh, man, these thoughts, I want to be an engineer. I want to create stuff. And he'd be like, I put those in you. You just don't know it. You're awakening to who I created you to be. Oh, I'm pleased with you because you're my son and my daughter. I'm pleased with you because you come sit in my lap. But I put those thoughts in you because i got plans for you. And if you'll just get up and do them, it might just be in being a mother. It could be just pushing a broom. and being. But I put those thoughts in you. Are y'all listening? I'm communicating really clear. Say this with me, purpose. I get it by sitting in my father's lap. And he's sneaky. Jehovah's sneaky. He does. Next thing is vision. Proverbs 28, 29, 18. Without vision, my people perish. What you focus on is what you're going to draw yourself to. Once you start knowing your purpose, what, sir, you know, start knowing what you're supposed to go after, you need to go after it. You need to write it down. Amen. Write it down. Write it down. This is what I'm going to do in my life. Write it down. Get yourself in a place where you go, Whoa, this is what Daddy said I'm going to do. This is what I feel like doing. And I'm writing it down. Vision, vision. It's creating vision. It's creating vision. Because without vision, what? People perish. Hosea 4, 6 says, lack of knowledge, my people destroy. I said, God, I don't understand it because we live in an information society. He said, information is not knowledge. You can have a lot of information and still be dumb as a brick. And just because you can Google it and find out and tell me I'm wrong about something that doesn't make you smart, knowledge means you can take the information and apply it in your life and see those things change. Amen. Amen. So lack of understanding of how to make something work is why people are destroyed, not lack of information. Good God, we live in a highway of information. It's zinging at you a mile, thousand, millions of miles a second. Vision, say this with me, purpose. Hang out with my papa. Vision, know where God wants me to go. Next verse. Put the next verse. Last one, James. James 2.20. But do you not know, O foolish man, that faith without works is what? Dead. Action! Purpose. Vision. And then start taking action. Start running at that thing. Start running at it with everything you've got in you. Start running at it. Thomas Edison. He was not a scientist. Ooh. Finally educated myself a little bit, reading about these people. Didn't understand. God was not a scientist. Knew nothing about science. He did not create electricity. He was trying to create the incandescent light bulb. He was trying to harness the power of electricity. 10,000 tries. Actually, 9,999, this is a true story. 9,999, him and his partner, he about blew them up. Literally, there was an explosion. 
And his partner said, you dummy, you about killed us. It's over. You're a failure. You'll never do this. He said, I'm not a failure. I just know what not to do next time. 9,990 times later. The problem is, is when we start having purpose and we start having vision and we start putting action towards it, we get resistance and immediately we stop and we go, well, I guess it just wasn't for me. It's just too hard. I mean, I really can't just eat right every day because if I do that, I like my cookies. (laughs) You know, I got to give myself a break here because I worked really hard, you know, and I deserve that freaking cake and five other pieces behind it. And my milk to go with it because it's chocolate. (laughs) You're going to run into resistance. Listen to me. Resistance is how a plane flies. Nobody, nobody sitting under my voice right now is not going to have resistance in your life. Why? Because it is part of the game. And God's like, listen, what faith says is I'm going after this. Thomas Edison, he went and took a nap. He's like, okay, I'm just going to go lay down. And he had a dream. You know what his dream was? (laughs) Uh, Tom, he said a light bulb came on. Yeah, it did. His dream was he had what we call, um, instead of creative imagination, he had a dream with synthetic imagination. What is synthetic imagination? It's taking two ideas that already exist and putting them together and making something beautiful. Creative imagination is taking something that doesn't exist and making it out of nothing like our father did. So he had a dream that they took wood. you can take wood and bury it under the ground, light it on fire, and it turns into coal. The pressure of it turns into coal, and it smolters. <gasps> but what keeps it from just no oxygen? The oxygen's just depleted. So he got it. Oh, my gosh. The reason that this thing won't work is because it's oxygen that's making that filament, that thing fire up. So he went and took a bottle and sucked all the oxygen out, took a cork and stuck it down in there, and the thing lasted for eight hours. Bingo, light bulb. 9,999 if he would have quit and listened to his friend. 9,000 times. 999 had people told you you can't be successful. Are you going to listen to him anymore, Jade? 9,000 times. I get discouraged after 10. Hello. But there's the promised land waiting for you. I'm not going to take the gold that God blessed him and turn into an idol. You'll, you'll actually, if you'll position your heart right, your failures will actually be invigorating because you know you're getting one step closer to what God's called you to do. When I started a children's home in India and I took $85,000 there and we dug the well, we bought the sheep, we took the plant in the rice fields and did everything for them, built the house for them, and then the guy steals the money from me. It was a failure that went deep into my heart and I got bitter he actually, actually, this house we built for him, for the children. He said, oh, we added another, like, 120 square foot and tried to charge me another $5,000 and brought a guy, which was a hitchman, to the meeting. A pastor did this to me. And his hitchman was supposedly the contract and started threatening me and my partner and saying, listen, if you don't pay us, there could be some bad things that happen. I said, you can shut up. If you're going to do it, you do it right now. I'm not giving you one more dollar. He looked at me. I said, we'll go to the authorities right now. I might be an American. I might not have no authority here in your country, but I'm going to the police right now. You just back off of me. You know what he did? He got on his motorcycle and left, and I looked at the pastor and said, brother, the blood of these children on your hands. I'm going home. Four years later, he calls me up. He was in America. Can you meet with me? And some guy emailed me and said, there was children feces on the wall because it was, so, it was so desperate of a situation. They didn't have any more money. So he took all these children and they quit feeding them. Because, uh, we won't get into all that. But I'm not looking at it as a failure. I'm one step closer to doing what God called me to do. Also, we sent a lady named Ruth there. When we had a baby, her name was Ruth. And we named the baby Ruth because the mama was pregnant at 17 without a father. And they were going to light her own fire. And her father said, get her away from me. They delivered the baby. And the baby was two days old. Brought it to the children's home. And we called the baby, Baby Ruth. Then they brought another baby there to Baby Ruth, to Mama Ruth, who had colic. And uh, no, no, what is the cough that won't stop? Not tuberculosis. Croup, crouping cough. The baby died. 
But Mama Ruth, for six hours, walked, praying over the baby, and the baby came back alive. Yeah. So there's still some things that happen, even though I didn't get to see. Guess what? I will have homes in India. I will have lots of homes in India. And if it's not me fulfilling it, my children's children will fulfill it. Because I'm going to be a philanthropist and I'm going to make lots of money so people can do the things that are in my heart. My vision is going to continue to speak long after I'm gone. What? Do you have a vision long enough to keep speaking long after you're gone? Stand up with me. I, I probably lost everybody in here. I won't throw it at you. You're going to have setbacks. But get encouraged. You're one step closer. So a guy was talking to Thomas Edison in an interview, and he said, hey, what would you be doing right now if you um, didn't see this light bulb? He says, I'd be in there still trying. Wouldn't be wasting my time talking to you. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Y'all, are y'all getting what I'm saying? Can you get so focused and put all your energies well, and if it don't work, well, maybe that wasn't your purpose. Maybe it wasn't what you're supposed to be doing. But you know what? It might work. You might just have to change how you're doing it. Please don't keep beating your head against something that's not working. Figure out, step back, and go, there's got to be an easier way than this. Amen? Okay. Boy, the energy just went. <laughs> Lift up your hands to the Father and say, thank you. I'm a child of God. I'm a child of God. Use your faith and imagination this week. Sit with the Lord. He loves you. 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 He's got a purpose for you. He's got a plan for you. He wants you to take faith and action towards it. Move towards it in Jesus' name. Move towards it. Take a step this week. Organize something. Straighten something out. Call somebody up and forgive them. Call somebody up and bless them. Do something a little bit different. I saw this little guy at Ace Hardware. Woo wee. He's supposed to be at church today. I'm going to go find him. He was asking for money. And when I came back outside, he had his pants leg pulled up because he'd gotten hit by a car in June, and his leg looked like it needed to be taken off. It had, I could see the infection in the leg. I said, buddy, can I pray for you? And I grabbed some money and gave it to him. And I grabbed all that man. <laughs> and the Holy Spirit goes, boosh. And some people are walking in and out. And he's over and just, ooh, ooh. And I was like, I said, the Lord's healing you. The Lord's healing you. I said, do you feel that? He's like, ooh, ooh, ooh. Couldn't even talk. I just got in my car and left. I love him. This moment with Jesus. Who wants to be healed this morning? Who wants to move forward of all the failures that you thought were failures but actually are just one step closer? What if you're three foot from gold and you just quit digging and sold all your equipment and started doing something different, but you were right there? Right there. Do you know that's what happened to these guys? They were gold diggers. They got discouraged and sold all their equipment for like pennies on the dollar and left. And the guy went and hired a geologist. And he says, oh, there's gold vein right there just three feet. Just three feet away. How many things have we missed out on? We're three feet away. Father, thank you for today. Sure. Thank you, Lord, for your presence. Now the Lord wants to do something that I don't can do, can't heal nobody, but he wants to heal people right now. I can't heal a headache, but Jesus is with me and he wants to heal you. Thank you, Lord. Receive healing now in your body in Jesus' name. I command all sickness, disease to leave right now in Jesus' name.
blood issues. I'm hearing blood disease or blood issues. Anybody have that right now? Does anybody have blood issues? Father, in the name of Jesus, there's two. Lord, I commend healing right now in Jesus' name. Robert, be healed. Just receive. Just say, Lord, I receive. You're the healer. I receive, Lord. Hmm. Amen. I love you guys. Let's go eat lunch. I preached a long time today. Have a wonderful Sunday. Thank you for joining our Sunday service live on YouTube. If you like this and you want more information, you can hit the notification button. You can subscribe to our channel. You can like us. We really appreciate you watching us. We'll be live every Sunday. We also have weekly wisdom and other videos coming out. Thank you so much. We love you guys. God bless you. Have a wonderful Sunday afternoon.